Thank you, teacher. I'm Junaid. Uh, for those of you who missed the beginning of the first part, I'm an IT professor of computer science and statistics at the University of Manitoba, Canada. And I will be presenting the second part of this uh, tutorial. Junaid, if you go back, we can't hear you very clearly, so please close to the microphone. I'm using the headphones microphone, actually. Okay. Help. Let me share my screen with you. I hope you can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. So in the second part, I will be talking about data models. Uh, Murat in the first part talked about uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain platforms, how uh, blockchains work. Now we are going to build on that foundation and talk about data, uh, user centrality, and what we are doing with blockchain data in general, what are the applications, how we data mine on blockchains. So uh, for data modeling, blockchains can be divided into two major categories. The first category, the earliest category was the transaction output based blockchains. These are cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, later cryptocurrencies such as Monero are using the same format. And the second type of blockchains are called account blockchains and these have started to become more prominent after 2015. These days, uh, blockchain platforms are account-based and Ethereum, for example, sees a lot of activity and it has kind of uh, taken over the cryptocurrencies popularity, you can say. So, I will start with uh, discussing transaction output based blockchains and those data. Here is a basic transaction on the left. You will see that a user is sending bitcoins to A and B. So these I just denote coin transfer. The same transaction can be modeled with a graph structure such as this one, where the transaction is shown with a rectangle and the addresses are shown with these terms. So there are three addresses in this one transaction here. And as you can see, the amount that enters the transaction and the amount that exits the transaction are two different things. This difference is collected by the block miner as the transaction fee. In reality, these transaction fees are nowhere near 0 0.2 bitcoins these days. These are very, very small these days because the network is not really congested. Next. Let's say B received bitcoins, two bitcoins in this transaction and wants to spend these coins in another transaction. It needs to show proof of funds. In the bottom picture, you will see the proof of funds. When B wants to spend these two bitcoins, it has to say, use the two bitcoins I received from block one, transaction one. This is the first transaction. And I want to pay this, I want to use this and pay 1.5 bitcoins to C and 0 0.3 bitcoins to B. The difference between the inputs and outputs is still 0 0.2, but the, this transaction fee depends on the user. So if you leave uh, high transaction fees, miners are more incentivized to include your transaction in a block. In the Genesis block, this is the first block that is created by Nakamoto on 3rd of January 2009. Uh, other than this, we have uh, every block has one coin based transaction that creates bitcoins and miner receives block rewards plus transaction fees. All the other payments in the system, other than the transaction in the Genesis block, has to show proof of funds. That means it has to show, it has to tell which previous output is spent. So here the coin based transactions are shown with these kind of parentless nodes that just start. These coin-based transactions are the way the Bitcoin creates coins. So this is like the printing transaction, money printing transaction. This graph, uh, I want you to be familiar with this graph. We will always use this. So from left to the right, the time increases. So a block here, block N, comes before block N plus one. And the network always increases, grows to the right. In these unspent transaction output based blockchains, we have three graph rules. 
The first rule is called the mapping rule. It says that multiple inputs can be signed separately by different users. And, and merged, but the input and output address mapping are not recorded. So if you look at this figure in the middle, you will see that the arrows enter the transaction node, which is a rectangle, and then exit it, but we don't see how the money moves in this transaction. Is the top node, top left node sending to top right node, or the top left node sending to bottom right node? We don't know this. By protocol, Bitcoin loses this information. So a transaction can be considered a lake with incoming rivers and outgoing emissaries. These are the emissaries. And the coins mix in this transaction lake. This creates a lot of problems for privacy, not for us, but for governments to detect how the coins are moving in the network. Heuristics are developed to link inputs to outputs, and we will cover them in the, in the privacy section later. The second rule says coins can be gained from multiple transactions. These multiple transaction outputs can be merged and spent at once, or they can be spent separately. But you cannot spend one output in two different transactions. So outputs are indivisible units. The third rule is the balance rule. It says all coins gained from a transaction must be spent in a single transaction. This is the indivisible output. Addresses cannot be changed. So if you have 10 bitcoins that you receive from one output and you want to spend nine bitcoins out of it and keep one bitcoin, you have to direct that one bitcoin to a new address that you create. And when you create it, other than you, nobody can really know that the address belongs to you. For example, in this figure you will see C, D, and E nodes. And we cannot know if C is selling its Bitcoins to D and E, or C is just selling Bitcoins to T and keeping the change in a new address E. C could also list itself as the new output address. This is called the address reuse. However, this happens rarely because the community practice is that whenever you need to create a uh, you need to keep change, you need to create a new address. For privacy purposes, you will see that we need to know if C and E belongs to the same user. Because if you want to keep track of coin movements in the network, you would like to link these addresses. But this is not possible by protocol. So a toy TXO graph looks like this. Here at the top, I'm showing three blocks. And you will see the blocks with different times going from left to the right. And there are six transactions and 12 addresses in these six transactions. So we create this graph by opening blocks, opening transactions, and linking these inputs and outputs in a graph structure. So we create this graph out of the blockchain transaction. Here we will see that, for example, T5 has an output address. That is A1. And we have seen A1 in the past at transaction T1. So in a sense, T5 is reusing an old address. This is Ray. Okay. At the bottom right, you will see that address 10 is using itself as the change address. That is even rarer. So usually what happens is A10 will create a new address A13 and direct the change to that address in transaction T1. Let's look at one edge that is not possible. For example, A5 in this graph receives outputs just from one transaction, T1. And A5 cannot create two transactions out of that output. Each output is individual. So this edge that is red dashed edge is not possible in the blockchain network. Next, I will talk about existing graph approaches. So coming from a social network analysis, actually, I think many of you will also agree with me that we tend to model graphs with just one type of node on. So ideally, the blockchain graph looks like something on the top left here. It has addresses, it has transactions, and the edges between address pairs are not explicitly recorded by protocol. But traditionally, our tools, our graph libraries use one type of node. So we would like to simplify this graph 
And the first approach is to create a transaction graph out of this blockchain. When you do this, you remove, you omit all the address nodes and you just keep the transaction. And the resulting figure is shown on the right that looks like a schema diagram. So this one, for example, this transaction graph approach cannot capture unspent coins. So this coin here on the top left that is circled in red, we cannot, we cannot see that information in the transaction graph. Then the transaction graph cannot also distinguish transaction with different inputs and outputs. So if you look at it, the top two transactions have the same shape, have the same kind of information. But if you go back to the blockchain graph, you will see that one of them has three inputs and three outputs. The other one has two inputs and two, three outputs. So they are not the same. We lose information by using this. The next approach is to use an address graph. That is used more commonly. So the address graph of the blockchain graph on the left is shown on the right. You will see too many edges in the address graph. This happens because for every input and output, you create one edge in the address graph. So some transactions in the Bitcoin, for example, can have 13,000 inputs. And I think the biggest number, were thir uh, number was 13,169 inputs. And the output can be like 7,000 at max. So these, how many addresses can be inputs and outputs are just constrained by the block size, which is one megabyte. So how many addresses can you fit into one megabyte of data? This is how many addresses you can see in a transaction. But when you have thousands of inputs and thousands of outputs, if you create an address graph out of it, it will create one million edges between them. So if you use the address graph without considering these things, you will have bias even for the medium that you use. So and another problem with the address graph is that once you have the, have the address graph, you have all these libraries that do uh, motif analysis, uh, clustering coefficient, all these things that you would like to run. However, in a blockchain, addresses are not supposed to reappear in the future, right? The address reuse is discouraged. And closed triangles are very rare. And out, output input address sets do not have edges to each other. So our tools that are based on network science do not consider this. They will just search for closing triangles and all, all sorts of edges in vain. And at the end of the day, they will just run and run and have nothing to result, uh, report. For these reasons, we always say that graph analysis with a single node of type on blockchain networks is not useful at all. Because Bitcoin and UTXO uh, networks are forever forward branching trees. It is more useful to consider them as growing trees instead of graphs. So with these limitations in 2018, we developed the ChainNet methodology. And with the ChainNet methodology, we have around uh, a couple of publications in ICDM, uh, PAKDD, in other venues as well. What we do is, instead of considering each edge and node, we consider each substructure in the node. And the substructure is called a chainlet. A one-dimensional chainlet is set to capture just one transaction with its input and output edges. Here is how it looks like. So consider that we have this network that uses, uh, that has four transactions. And out of these four transactions, when we look at one dimensional chain nets, we will take each transaction with its inputs and outputs. So the first transaction has this shape, three inputs, three outputs. The second transaction has two inputs, three outputs. The third transaction has two inputs and two outputs. And the fourth transaction, again, has two inputs and two outputs. In a sense, the third and the fourth transaction have the same shape. They have the same one dimension, they are the same one dimensional chain. What we do is we aggregate network information in terms of these chain nets. And we say there are three distinct types of chain nets within this period in the network. This is very helpful. First, let's consider how the chain net types can be classified. The first classification can be done in terms of number of inputs and number of outputs. So we say 
if the input number is equal to the output number, the funds, the coins are just changing hands. These are transition changes. Next, if we have more output than input, we can say these are split chain nets and they may imply spending behavior because the spending address can make a payment to the first address and keep the change in the second address. And these chain nets are shown with this symbol C1 to 2, that means C has one input and two outputs. The third type is the merge chain nets that imply a gathering of funds. So it has more inputs than output. This implies, for example, buying coins in large amounts, and we see this very often. When we look at the Bitcoin network from the very beginning, 2009 to 2020, these are the days in the x-axis, and this is showing the merged state and transition chain nets and their percentages in the network. So you will see until 2012 or something, the network was not stabilized at all. And then around 2013, I guess it was 2013, uh, people bought two pizzas for 10,000 people. And you can see spam attacks here, but generally speaking, as the Bitcoin price is stabilizing and it is appreciating, you will see more split chain nets. That means people are just paying and then keeping the change. So, how can we represent networking type, the blockchain networking type? If we can do that, then we could use that data in machine learning algorithms for predictive and persistent tests, right? So what we do is for a given time granularity, let's say 24 hours, we take the snapshot of the Bitcoin graph, and then we basically count the chain net types in that network. So here I am showing you the occurrence network, it has inputs on the rows and outputs on the columns. So for example, here, a chain net that has three inputs and three outputs would be on the third row and third column. A chain net that has two inputs and two outputs would be on the second row and the second column. And here you see, in our toy example, we have two chain nets that have that specific type and they are here uh, shown together. So if we count them and keep the Occurrences in a matrix, we will have a nice matrix that has counts of chain nets and but zeros in the other cells. So one question is, how big should the matrix be? So theoretically, this can go to 10,000 by 10,000, right? But most of the entries would be just zero, so it would be very small. So it makes sense to store very large matrix. The answer is, we went to the data to check this. And we found that 90% uh, of the chain nets have less than one, uh, five inputs and five outputs. So if we use an N of 20, so if we use a matrix of 20 by 20, we can store 97.57% of chain nets in our occurrence matrix, which is ideal. What happens if a chain net falls outside the matrix? So let's say we are using only matrices of two by two, and we have a chain net that has three inputs or three outputs. In that case, we store this in the last column of the matrix, and we consider these last columns as the extreme chain. So if we are using 20 by 20, the 20th row and 20th column are the extreme chain net rows and columns. And here is the formula of how we uh, use it. Here, I'm showing only the occurrence matrix. We can, uh, we can store the amount information as well in that matrix, and we have uh, multiple verbs on how we can predict the price of Bitcoin and Litecoin by using these chain nets, and we found that it brings uh, a lot of power to prediction. So it is very helpful uh, to consider the chain net methodology instead of just using uh, address and transaction graph approaches. The second type, other than uh, in addition to unspent transaction output based blockchains, is account based blockchains. Most blockchain platforms, such as Ethereum and NEO, use account based blockchains. In these blockchains, every transaction involves just one input address and one output address. And as you can see, we cannot use the chain net methodology here directly. These, these type of graphs lend themselves very well to traditional network analysis. 
So another has spent coins from a balance and keep the change. So you can keep the change without creating any work. So you see address linking, address clustering is much easier on these networks. Each transaction of an address has an order that is stored in an integer called nonce. And the nonce is the number of transactions sent to the network. So an address cannot create the third transaction before the first and second transactions are included in previous blocks or transactions. If a, if a nonce arrives without previous nonce, it has to wait, so the transaction waits. So, account-based blockchains have two types of transactions. The first transaction is, is the usual transfer of a cryptocurrency, such as Ether on Ethereum. So these type of transactions are exactly like Bitcoin transactions. They just transfer the coin. The second type are called internal transactions. They involve a transfer of smart contract-based tokens. And these internal transactions are, let's say, more interesting. And they are based on state changes of smart contracts. So smart contracts store these variables in key value stores. And whenever a value of a key changes, we say there's an internal transaction. Internal transaction can be discovered by parsing the transaction payload message or by running the transaction message through the Ethereum virtual machine and then looking at the result. So, a transaction message on Ethereum looks like this. Here you are seeing the transfer function that has two parameters, the address two and the value inside the integer 256 bits. The method ID is given with an hex code and two parameters are also given in hex and you, you see these values. On this figure, you see the left address is a circle and the right address is not a circle because the right address is a contract address. Contract address. Here, an ordinary user is just sending four ethers to a smart contract. Most commonly, this means the user is sending these ethers to buy whatever this contract address is selling. In this, in this case, for example, a transaction can transfer both currencies and tokens, but usually if a transaction is just sending tokens, it has a zero ether field. So here we send four ethers. And then the value is this value, that is the parameter in the payload, in the transaction payload. So an internal transaction can create multiple edges. So there can be a transaction that will update the value of multiple keys, but this is rare. Most of the internal transactions are one-to-one. -one. And they mean, for example, I am selling my crypto asset and I'm selling my crypto asset to Murat. So it will include it will involve still one recipient and one sender. It works like this. It can be a bit tricky because you have to pass the internal transaction to see who is buying and who is selling. So consider this scenario. On the top, I am showing transaction zero. The user B is sending 0.3 ethers to the storage token. It says, I want to buy two storage tokens. And the storage token will update its key value store and it says B has two tokens. In the future, A can buy tokens from B. So A sends 0.2 ethers to B, and the price of the token has decreased from 0.15 to 0.1. So that means A is actually buying the two tokens that B previously bought. Then B, after receiving the money, after receiving the ether, creates another transaction and sends it to the token contract smart uh, token smart contract address and says, send my two coins to address A. And all of these can be represented by this graph that I'm showing at the bottom. So A is first sending, sorry, B is first sending 0.3 ethers to the smart contract, and then A is sending 0.2 ethers, and then B is creating another transaction to the smart contract. However, you don't need to record that transaction. You can record what internal transaction it created. So this edge that goes from B to A and contains this two storage token is the real transaction. If you do not extract that information, you will see B creating another transaction for the token smart contract, but you will not understand what happens in the internal transaction. I hope this is clear. So we model account-based blockchains as directed weighted multi-graphs and 
For example, this figure comes from the storage network on a day from our Chartalis project. You will see there are multiple edges between addresses, there is almost no community structure, it is very sparse, and clustering coefficients are very low. Very low. Uh, we looked at core decomposition, it's also very bad in the sense that almost all the nodes are deleted in the first iteration of the K-core decomposition. In these adversarial settings, we use topological data analysis tools. For example, I will not go into detail, but you can look at this, uh, this paper of us that uses persistent homology in topological data analysis in predictive tasks for price anomaly predictions. So, one interesting thing about token networks is that every token has its own set of investors, but these investors mostly use the same address. Of course, address creation is free, so they could create a new address and buy a new token with that address, but mostly they use the same address for some time. So you can see which investors are buying tokens and how, it, how these tokens are moving on the blockchain network. So the edge types can be different, but the nodes are the same, which is very nice. And consider that we have all these blockchain events from real world. For example, when China banned cryptocurrencies, we saw prices decline, and these events are well documented in news uh, articles. These can be used as external ground truth. Also, the token prices are arbitrated in real world, right? So you can see when a token's price increased 10% or decreased 10%. These can be used as external ground truth. So if you have let's say multi-layer net uh, data mining algorithms on multi-layer networks. Here you have the ideal test set with different token networks with external ground truth that comes from two different sources, which is, which is a very good set. You can, you can find the token networks on our repository here at the SPM 2020 paper, and we will have the event data sets for another paper uploaded in this repository. So you can start working on that directly. So account-based blockchains lend themselves to traditional network tools and algorithms very well because there is only one type of model. Motive analysis, core decomposition, centrality and clustering algorithms, they can be easily adapted. And another thing is we have high granularity data. Ethereum blocks appear every 12 to 15 seconds. So you have uh, you have very fine granularity data that you can analyze feature changes with time series analysis. And then we have these rich variety of crypto assets. On Ethereum, we started with ERC20 tokens, then we have ERC721 tokens. We now have stable coins and decentralized finance transactions. There are many interesting research problems, and these are problems that involve billions of dollars. We can predict token price, we can detect price manipulation, we can analyze token health, we can look at robustness, inter-token impact analysis, we can analyze investor behavior. There are a lot of interesting research problems. So after these uh, TXO and account graphs, I will talk a little bit about privacy. And privacy on blockchain networks usually involves clustering and linking addresses. And on blockchain, we can talk about four different types of uh, privacy and security research. First one is data privacy, transaction and identity privacy. Second one is data availability. These involve the peer-to-peer peer -to -peer network traceability and equity effects. Then we have data integrity and data controllability, but I will not talk about them because we have very limited time. So in public blockchain, by definition, data is continuous public. So there are no honeypots of personal data on the blockchain. And public blockchains are pseudo-anonymous. For example, on Bitcoin, there is no registration to join the network, but after you join the network and have an address, everyone can trace what your address is and how it was involved in transactions. However, tracing amounts, tracing coins are very difficult. And we will talk about it. For your Network security, you could use Tor and I2P to connect to the network. But the biggest threat comes from know your customer rules of online exchanges and banks, where you have to upload your driving license or your passport to open an account. 
once the government knows that you have been involved with an address, they can just ask your bank to say, do you know the identity of this address? And they have to give this information. So they can find you very easily. So here I'm showing a very simple uh, network on Bitcoin. And I'm asking you this question. What do you think about address A? Which other addresses may have sent Bitcoins to this address. So you see everything is public. You can see all the flows. And is it easy to see which addresses are sending Bitcoin? It turns out it's not so easy. Here in this case, for example, possibly A receives coins from nine addresses. So these traceability issues are studied in fungibility st uh, studies. It says if a coin is tainted, which means if a coin has a bad history, if a coin is earned by ransoming a company, it will be very difficult to sell that specific coin. Taint analysis studies try to capture that history and try to warn banks not to, not to buy these coins from the users. But for this, we need to link addresses. How can we link addresses? Uh, heuristics are used. So there is no definitive answer. Heuristics are used to detect which input and output addresses are controlled by the same user. It would be easy if people could not mix amounts in transactions. Consider the figure on the left. By looking at that figure, you can see that at least some coins from A reached both C and D because B is only contributing one Bitcoin and both C and D receive more than one Bitcoin. So A is definitely paying to C and D. There is no, there is, there is no answer to this. However, if we do a similar network with the identical amount on the right, now you can see that you cannot know which one Bitcoin is coming from which one Bitcoin. So we can, we can look at this. And in the literature, Sarah Mapplejohn has these, uh, collected these three heuristics, two of them, uh, appeared first in other papers, and these are called the address clustering heuristics. The first one is the idioms of use. Uh, it says that all input addresses in a transaction should belong to the same entity. Now, consider this. On Bitcoin, each input can be signed separately. So there is no, it is, it is not deterministic that A, B, and C belong to the same user. I can sign A, I can, I can take that signed transaction and send it to Murat. Murat can sign B and can send this transaction to Yulia. Yulia can sign C and then finally can just send this transaction, related transaction to the transaction network. So even in this heuristic, which is the safest of them all, it's not really certain that A, B, and C belong to the same user, but we consider them to be to belong. Next is the transitive closure. It's just an uh, extension of the idioms of use. It says if a transaction has inputs from A and B, whereas another transaction has from A, C, and B, B and C belong to the same user. So all these addresses, A, B, C, D, and E, belong to the same user. The third one is trickier. So it uses the change address heuristic. It says a spending address in this bottom right example is sending 10 bitcoins to a payment address and the change address. And here we can kind of guess that the change address is really a change address because its amount is small or something. But you see the logic could also be reversed. You could say 0 0.5 is the payment address and 9.5 is the change address. So there are additional rules for this that says the output address, the change address, has not appeared in any previous transaction. The transaction is not a coin generation transaction. There is no self change address. So if these four conditions hold, then they consider this to be the change address of the spanning. Things are a bit more difficult on account blockchain. Uh, sorry, a bit easier on account blockchain because on account blockchains, we have one-to-one -one transactions. And uh, Victor has these three rules. The first one is called the deposit rule that says if exchange controlled exchanges are giving deposit addresses to ordinary users, 
and we can see which ordinary users are sending coins to these deposit addresses, we can cluster these user addresses. So in this figure, for example, we can see five entities. Two of them are exchanges, so these dashed ones, and this one, exchange A and exchange B. And then we have three potential users, the first user, and the second, third, and fourth addresses belong to the same user, and the fifth and sixth addresses also belong to another one. And we can catch this because they are sharing the same deposit address. The second tool from Victor says that when there is an airdrop, this is the coin, coin sharing scheme where the uh, inventors of a coin, creators of a coin, basically give their tokens for free to influential users so that influential users will bring them publicity. In this case, if some addresses receive airdrops and then collect them, in a sense, merge them in an address, we can say that these addresses belong to the same user. The third heuristic in, heuristic in this line is the authorization rule. Uh, this comes from the ERC20 function author. Uh, ERC token standard uses this approve function to allow another address to spend tokens on behalf of the actual owner. So through this execution, a spender address gains access to a limited amount of tokens. That means an address allows another address to spend its tokens. And when that happens, we can assume that the two addresses belong to the same user. This functionality is mainly used with smart contracts, especially decentralized exchanges. However, uh, this type of authorization can also be used for regular external addresses. Uh, there are more clustering heuristics for other blockchains. Uh, I know at least one for the Ripple blockchain. And Please also look at the unreasonable effectiveness of address clustering to see this. Address clustering can also be done at the peer-to-peer -peer network level, but I will not go into detail because we don't have enough time for this. Okay. So, one final note about address clustering. Whether you are on UTXO or account-based blockchains, by nature, all the clustering heuristics are error prone so some community practices uh, further complicate the issue because they require you to create a, for example, new change address, don't use the uh, input address as the chain, things like this. So community practice makes it even more difficult. And then online exchanges, rather than publishing all the, blo uh, all the transactions to the blockchain, sometimes do these in-house bookkeeping. I buy a token from Murat, but Exchange does not really uh, create a transaction. It just gives me the private keys of keys of Murat. They do this to save uh, money for the transaction fees. Okay, so the user of the address changes, but nothing is recorded on the blockchain. And if you look at the blockchain, they periodically write some transactions, some aggregate transactions to the blockchain. Clustering can be improved by considering IP location which we cannot, cannot really learn uh, unless we are running hundreds of nodes and connecting to many, many network peers. Governments can do this. Sometimes they do this to catch uh, illicit payments. So in terms of hiding your coins in the system, the term obfuscation is used. The goal is to hide coin movement in the network and to finally cash out of the system after going through multiple steps. In this, we can talk of three regimes with increasing sophistication. From 2009 to 2013, but really 2012 to 2013, I think 2014, we, we saw some hiding patterns. So ordinary users were receiving, for example, ransomware payments, not ordinary hackers were receiving or uh, ransom payments or darknet market uh, sellers were receiving payments and they assumed that the law enforcement agencies did not have enough analytics capabilities to go through the network and trace all the payments. Which, uh, which stopped really functioning for them after these companies, chain analysis companies started to come online. 
So they are helping the government with it. Then around 2013, coin minting scheme started. I will talk about coin minting shortly. Then in 2018, with the shape shifting companies, which buy your bitcoins, for example, and pay you in another cryptocurrency. So in a sense, they are shift, they are uh, changing the shape, the amount, the type of your cryptocurrency. And once you sell your Bitcoin and buy some privacy coins, you could lose your track in the privacy coins and come back to the system and buy Bitcoins again. These shape-shifting companies usually open an API uh, in a sense to comply with the government rules because in a sense they are abetting criminals. They may abet criminals because they can hide this linkage between uh, painted addresses and uh, privacy coins, right? So they open APIs, and in a recent case, uh, Nicole John published a paper on shape shifting and how it was possible to identify which coins are going and coming back. After they, that, they shut down the API. I don't know if it's still open. So it was fast. In the first obfuscation effort, uh, you, for example, use a peering chain. So you start with a large Bitcoin amount in a single address, and then you peel small amount and create a transaction where a small amount is sent to one address, and the remainder is sent to a one-time change address. The process repeated hundreds of times, it looks like this. So you always repeat it, and at the end, what you can do is you can merge these individual peels, or you could sell them separately. In any case, when you see algorithmic behavior like this, it's kind of easier to catch the behavior. It's not very difficult. Uh, we have some clues, some visual clues that people are using a lot of uh, a lot of transactions with similar shapes. This figure comes from this uh, paper. However, it is not the peeling chain. It is just a spam transaction figure in 2015, I guess. Some, uh, some people were trying to push Bitcoin to increase the Bitcoin block limit from one megabyte to eight megabytes. So they were creating these spam transactions so that the network would be congested. And so people would push to increase the block size. Of course, Bitcoin people are very conservative. They didn't change anything and spam attacks died after some time. So in coin mixing, the second scheme, things look a little bit better for malicious people. Uh, the initial idea, was to use a central server and send your Bitcoin to that server. Then you would get ordinary people also send their coins to the server, and the server will mix these inputs and create addresses for you and send your coins to an address and then let you know the private key of that. So one question was asked, why would ordinary people join in this scheme? They would join in this scheme because there was some payout. So the server would pay them money. If you, if you send us one Bitcoin, we will send you 1.5 Bitcoins, for example, so that you will have the criminals or privacy aware people get away. So a coin would move like this. The red coins are the same coins that are moving in the system. And there's a huge literature about this coin, chain, coin join, coin shuffle. Uh, in, these, uh, in this presentation, I am giving representative uh, articles that you can follow. So, traceability problems uh, gave rise to kind of privacy coins. Bitcoin is especially pseudo-anonymous, which means uh, your, nobody knows if an address belongs to you. However, once they know it, they can see all of your history, which is not ideal. In order to avoid this, new cryptocurrencies have been developed. For example, we have the Cash cryptocurrency, Monero cryptocurrency, and Dash cryptocurrency. Dash cryptocurrency is, I, I believe, the earliest one of them. Dash uh, makes coin mixing as a native protocol. So it does coin mixing in a protocol level. The Cash cryptocurrency is using zero knowledge proofs. And the Monero cryptocurrency is using ring signatures to hide transaction uh, inputs. These cash and Monero uh, blockchains can hide the sender, can hide the receiver, they can even hide the transaction amount. I have more slides about this, but I omitted. However, it's useful to talk about them a little bit. So 
in Zcash and Monero, in Zcash, let's start with it. In Zcash, you need to generate zero knowledge proofs, which increase the transaction size too much. So one problem with these Zcash transactions is that transactions are too big. And it requires a lot of setup to create a transaction. You need to do a lot of cryptography work. In Monero, it uses multiple uh, ring signatures. And ring, ring signatures means you can have multiple inputs. And one of the inputs are real. The other ones are decoys. These decoys are called mixing transactions. When Monero started, you could choose to have zero mixing or more mixing. So in a sense, you could create just Bitcoin transactions on Monero if you use zero mixing. However, if you use zero mixing, it was reported in two, three papers that in the future, somebody could uh, find out when some of the mixing are decoys. So the privacy was leaked when you use zero mixing. They increased the required minimal mixings to four, and these days it is 10 mixings. So when you create a transaction, there is your input, and then you have to list 10 other inputs that are fake. But consider how the transaction size is blocked in this case. Instead of one address, you are writing 11 addresses to the blockchain. And in Zcash, for example, if I'm not wrong, they found that in Zcash also you could do unshielded transactions, which means just ordinary transactions where everything is visible. And you could use shielded transactions where nothing is visible. They found that the percentage of shielded transactions, these secure private transactions, are less than 10% of all the transactions. So even though people have this functionality, they are not really using it. But privacy coins, the biggest threat to privacy coins uh, comes from government regulations. Basically, governments don't want uh, hackers and other malicious people to use these privacy coins because if you use them efficiently, you can really lose track of your coin. You can do multiple transactions and then you can end up at one address and then nobody can see the history of that address. And then you can sell your money, your Zcash, at that address to an exchange and cash out. Another solution that came with the Lightning Network. So Bitcoin had all, always had a scripting language, but the scripting language, especially some old codes, were removed after 2012 because they found some bugs. So Bitcoin scripting language is never designed to be Turing complete, unlike the Ethereum. Uh, in 2017, I believe, they implemented a second layer solution that uses Bitcoin scripting language to create direct payment channels between users. On this network, on this second layer network on top of blockchain, uh, you can route your transactions in the network. So I can send money to Murat, even if I don't know Murat person. People in the middle will facilitate this process. This comes from the Havala network in Africa where people just pay each other send money to each other in different countries. The idea is similar. Uh, only the first and last transactions are written to the blockchain. Each channel has a capacity. So when you send money in one direction, the capacity of the channel in that direction is reduced. And when it is depleted, you cannot send money anymore. So in this second layer network, in this lightning network, you can have an unlimited number of transactions, uh, only restricted by the channel capacity. But you only have to write the first transaction and the last transaction that finally uh, closes the channel and pays out what is left. That means if someone, if two people are using the Lightning Network, we cannot see each transaction individually. We will only see the aggregate information. This Lightning Network was designed for microtransactions, for transactions that are so small that transaction fees will be a higher percentage uh, than it is useful for. However, Lightning Network can be used for any amount. So people have been using it. Uh, it is very popular these days. 
It is good for transaction privacy. You cannot see individual transactions. However, it's not good for identity privacy because you can see the channel. When someone creates the channel, you know that there is a channel between two people. And in terms of balances, it seems that there are still human errors in Lightning Networks that allows probing channel balances. This uh, recent paper came out that is influential. Uh, Bill Yukov is usually working in this field and has multiple papers on this. I would advise you to check that. Okay. So let's come to the applications of blockchains in real life. And the first application that comes to mind is the darknet market. Darknet markets are places, online websites that are reachable to store and I2P services, and they accept payment in cryptocurrency. So for example, Silk Road was the most successful early darknet market until it was uh, seized by the US government. And Alphabay is the longest lived darknet market uh, that reached 800,000 transactions daily, uh, dollars daily. In these markets, users sell anything from heroin to guns and uh, US passports and everything. And the goods are physically mailed at addresses. And there are even intercontinental mails. It works like this, a buyer first goes to an online exchange and buys Bitcoin. And then the buyer sends this money uh, to the darknet account. And the darknet account notifies the seller that the money arrived. Then the seller physically mails the good. Until the good arrives, the money is held by the darknet market. And after the good arrives and the seller says that, uh, sorry, the buyer says that the good arrived, the darknet market takes a cut, a percentage, a commission, and then pays the vendor. In early days, uh, when Bitcoin was used uh, by these darknet markets mainly, and there was the gambling in the uh, gambling and these markets, uh, Darknet payments were even impacting the price. And the researcher found that uh, he could track darknet sales and then these sales would have an impact after six days when the escrow payments were released. A second type of application of blockchains in real life is unfortunately ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malware that infects the victim's data and resources and demands ransom to release them. Uh, in two, two main types, ransomware can lock access to resources or encrypt their content. And in addition to computer systems, ransomware can also infect IoT devices and mobile devices. And especially in terms of research, I see a lot of activity in mobile devices. And there are many research papers on detecting uh, ransomware on mobile devices. Once the resources are locked or encrypted, the ransomware displays a, displays a message that asks a certain amount of Bitcoins to be sent to a Bitcoin address. So this, uh, this process can also be automated. Uh, the, Encryption keys can be created on the infected computer and sent to a command and control center. And until recently, these ransomware were using Bitcoin, but these days we see new and new, uh, more and more ransomware that accepts Monero payments. And Monero is a privacy coin. So once the coins are received in Monero, we can say that uh, governments will not be able to really catch these attacks. The ransom amount depends on the number and the size of the encrypted resources. Uh, in the news, we hear that hospitals are hit with $300,000 ransom and uh, municipalities recently made a decision to not pay the ransom, whatever happens. After payment happens, uh, a decryption tool is delivered to the victim that the victim can use. In some cases, uh, in early ransomware prototypes, 
the hackers made a mistake, they could not distinguish who paid. So some of the victims, even though they paid, they could not uh, save their data from that. So we have a recent work on uh, ransomware payment detection on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, as all the payments are visible on the network, it actually is a fascinating application of data science on blockchain. Can we automatically identify ransomware payments? Most ransomware payments are, uh, some ransomware payments are reported by companies, but most of them uh, go unreported. A company does not want to disclose that its computers were infected, that it's being ransomed. So they keep it quiet, they just pay. And starting from 2012, we have seen an increase in ransomware payments all the time. In a sense, blockchain and cryptocurrencies have given arms and legs to these ransomware schemes because now they can ransom you from remote corners of the world and they can accept payments from you. They don't need to open an account in a bank to receive payments. Blockchain allows them to reach everyone. And on the network, as we can see all the payments, we have some information about past ransom payments because some companies reported them and researchers collected these addresses. So we can use the past known addresses as training data and we can try to predict which payments were undisclosed. Even we can predict the emergence of new ransomware families. We can find that in the future there are these clusters of addresses that are using similar patterns, whatever these are, and we can label them as suspicious. Once we label them as suspicious, the government can go and check addresses and try to find their real life identity. So what we do in this? In this work that was published, uh, that accepted each guy, uh, we take the network, we divide it into 24 hour snapshots and we accept six network features. We accept income, which looks at how many Bitcoins the address is receiving. By loop, we look at uh, how many loops are closing at that address. This comes from the peering chain. We look at neighbors, that means how many transactions there are. Uh, we look at weight, that means how many of the transactions are pouring their bitcoins into this address. We look at count, length, these features are defined in the network, in the, in the article. However, I want to note that we created these features because we kind of know the obfuscation effort. So each feature is designed to catch one of the obfuscation features. Ideally, in the future, there could be deep learning schemes on this, but right now we don't have enough data to do this without feature extraction. So we have around 20,000 addresses only among 800,000 uh, daily nodes. So deep learning is not going to work so far. So once we extract this, we can look at the, the ransomware addresses and compare how they differ from ordinary addresses, right? So in this table, we are showing the most frequent feature values in ransomware addresses. And you will see the first uh, row in the table at the top uh, is used by 327 addresses here. And once we look at this feature, by feature I mean this vector of values, they are very common. Overall, they are the most common uh, feature for ordinary addresses in the Bitcoin network. So in a sense, finding this pattern in the ransomware address doesn't really tell us anything. Because it's, anyways, all the addresses have the same pattern. The second pattern is more interesting. As you can see, we have 250 addresses with this one. And in overall ranking, this pattern would not be in the top 100 pattern. So once we see this pattern, there is a very strong, I would say, uh, uh, probability that this is somehow related to ransomware addresses. These ransomware addresses come from three studies. Uh, we merge these addresses and use them as our ground truth. So these, uh, you see 
some of these addresses that appear in the top 10 list of ransomware addresses, some of these patterns are not common at all on the Bitcoin network. This appears as the 327 track. So, what we notice is that most payments have multiple inputs and just one output or two outputs. By just using this pattern and searching it on the network, we actually discovered many loopholes. However, this also brings around uh, 30, 40, 50 false positives for each pound positive. So we needed to use something uh, smarter than just pattern searching. We have multiple questions in the paper, but one of the questions that we were really interested in was, do the ransomware hackers use the same pattern? Once they receive the Bitcoins, do they use the same things and cash out of the system? Or do they use the same pattern to receive the money? This pattern is important because as you can see, the ransom address where they are paid receives coins from ransomed people. And ransomed people can use multiple patterns to send coins. Ransomware operators are not yet asking them to create transactions, for example, just with one input and one output to pay these addresses. You can use any pattern that you want. And here, when we look at this, we will see that there are some commonalities between ransomware addresses of each ransomware malware. Uh, but generally, hackers of a ransomware use multiple patterns. So they don't use the same pattern all the time. If they use the same pattern, it would be very easy to catch them, easier to catch them. These TSNE results show this. So there are multiple patterns used by these hackers, and somehow we need to catch them. Next, we looked at the clustering of these ransomware addresses. Here I am showing the top uh, seven, eight ransomware addresses. On the x-axis, we have the number of clusters overall. And on the y-axis, we show how many, how much percent of the addresses from that ransomware cluster together. So pure cluster means in that cluster, we only find addresses from that given ransomware. Um, if the pureness is low, that means ransomware payments are using multiple patterns, so it will be difficult to catch them. But as you can see, for clusters, for 12,000 clusters, you can actually get almost 35% pureness for some ransomware. So there is some good evidence that we could catch these ransomware payments. I will show the results for uh, two experiments. The first one is detecting undisclosed payments. Uh, in, this, in this, we used topological data analysis. We just did naive covariance similarity search. We used clustering with known past ransomware addresses with TV scans. We used random forest and XGBoost. Random forest results are not yet because in this table, I am only showing the top two results for each ransomware family. So there are these parameters that are L, how many uh, past days we are looking to train on and add. These are not very relevant. However, I want to show you one. First thing is the recall can be as high as 90% for some ransomware families that you're looking. The precision is low. In the best case, we have 0 0.16 as the precision. However, consider that most of the ransomware payments are not reported. So in the paper, we further analyze these addresses after we label them as ransomware. We go and look at them in the network if there is additional evidence that these may be ransomware. And in fact, we find them multi. So we find some addresses multiple times. Some addresses are used 10, 15 times, 10, 10 15 different days. So we have a very strong opinion about this and we believe that these are ransomware payments that are not reported. In that case, the precision cannot really be improved. In general, CDA helps us to predict 16.59 false positives for each true positive. This is a very good value because consider that uh, we are looking at 
800,000 addresses data. So a government analyst, for example, when looking for these ransomware payments, cannot just go and manually check all these addresses. If we could just reduce the search space, that would be very useful. And in fact, we are reducing it tremendously. In the second experiment, we did something even more interesting. So detecting undisclosed payments from a ransomware family is difficult, but it is attainable because you have past addresses from the same ransomware family. You can look at their patterns and try to learn these undisclosed payments. What happens if we use the past data of other ransomware addresses to predict the emergence of a new family? So a new family for the first time appears and it accepts payments. Can we identify these addresses specifically? And can we say that these addresses may either belong to old ransomware families or they may be new ransomware themselves. We cannot distinguish them because we use the past data of all other ransomware addresses, right? So, however, we can say these addresses are suspicious. And the result in this case is very interesting. For the cryptics, for example, if you look at the results, we, at the day that cryptics appear, we identify two addresses that we believe are suspicious to be ransomware addresses. One of them, in the future, we learn that is in fact a true ransomware address, and one of them is false positive. However, even in this case, we believe that this false positive is also a ransomware address that is undeposited. So in summary, in this case, we catch two addresses, and one of them is a true positive. However, this uh, new family prediction has results that are not as good as uh, undisclosed address prediction because here in the first experiment, we were getting 1659 addresses, false positives for each true positive. Here we are getting 27.53 false positives for each true positive. So these results are uh, need more data they are not as certain as the first experiment. So, another application, so we talked about darknet payments and ransomware payments. The third case is the pump and dump scheme on crypto assets. So, malicious groups communicate on private channels, such as Telegram, to start buying a crypto asset at a certain time. Usually, this happens, an organizer, like the chief, uh, creates a telegram channel and says, watch this channel at 9 p.m. on April 25th, for example, I will give you a name of a token on the Ethereum blockchain, and we will all go and buy this token. Once people start buying this, the trading asset volume sees a sudden increase. And the increasing volume, of course, causes interest from the uninformed public who fear missing out. So ordinary people see that, oh, this token is increasing in price. I should buy it. And I don't know the information. Other, other people might have had better information than me. They buy this asset. After the price increases above a threshold, the early buyers sell the asset to newcomers, and they leave the exchange. And the new buyers basically are left with these tokens that they bought for high prices. And because it was a price manipulation scheme, they cannot really find new users to sell them. So they are left with these tokens. And more interestingly, and even damningly, these schemes do not happen on the blockchain directly. Because Ethereum, for example, allows a block in every 12 to 15 seconds. What happens is the exchange buys and sells from its customers in the, in the site. So they don't publish these transactions to the blockchain. That means a user can buy and then in two seconds can sell. These pump and dump schemes start and end in let's say two minutes. When that happens, usually the person that organizes the scheme to begin with, before letting everyone know the token's name, goes and buys some tokens himself so that he can sell to the 
people who will participate in this piece. If overall, as nothing is published to the blockchain, we can only use the book order data from exchanges to detect these pump and dump schemes. And these are given in APIs of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges or token exchanges. It's an interesting, uh, interesting application. One thing that is found is that uh, when this pump and dump scheme happens, it may actually help a token in terms of its price. So in some pump and dump schemes, people are left with tokens with no one to sell, and it helps the token's price in the long term. Uh, see Victor's papers about this. So, a few remarks. Uh, blockchains are pseudonymous. Except for the privacy coins, it's not really, uh, except for the privacy coins, it's possible to track any given coin. This is always said. However, in reality, traceability is very difficult. And it's almost impossible with mixing services. With coin mixing and shape shifting, it's almost impossible to track coins. Uh, when people talk about catching uh, darknet owners, for example, you would need to know that they are caught not because their online identities were linked to their IP addresses, but mostly because they made a mistake and they leaked their identity in the early days of their company. So, for example, Alpha Bay owner used an email address to send automated user emails and used the same email to register a business account. Silk Road owner, for example, a darknet market, searched for a developer when he was first creating the darknet market by using his email. So they are caught because of these issues, these human errors. And in privacy of their coins, we still have issues in terms of human judgment. For example, in Monero, they found that mixins must be carefully uh, calibrated to avoid privacy leakage. But privacy coins in general are still not adopted widely. And they suffer from uh, bloated transaction sizes or transaction generation costs. So people are not really using them. In the Zcash case, less than 10% of the transactions are shielded transactions. 90% are unshielded transactions. In terms of visualization, uh, we have a nice survey that came out recently. You can have a look at it. And a Bitcoin network visualization analysis library Viva is also available online. I will leave uh, here with some directions. Uh, for money laundering, uh, please see Moser's work on, uh, at ECRS. For the ransomware payments, our, our recent work, Bitcoin High, kind of uh, aggregates all the past information. We also use- Junaid, the uh, user has a question on the chat. Okay, excuse me. So uh, Bitcoin High uh, aggregates all this information about past ransomware addresses. Uh, a very interesting case, use case of Bitcoin is uncovering human traffickers. And for personal blackmail, please see the address paper. And now I will take some questions. Okay, yeah, let's, let, let me uh, rephrase my question. So I'm asking, uh, mixing, you talk about mixing in the context of uh, uh, UTXO based uh, blockchains, is it also possible in Ethereum or other account based uh, blockchains? It is possible if only you use a smart contract to receive some incoming payments and then distribute them. In, bit, in Ethereum, one of the recent uh, coin mixing applications is the Tornado Cash. If you search for it, Tornado Cash, uh, mm -hmm. that allows doing it and it receives some money in the latest uh, money based fund, uh, fundraising stage. So they are trying to develop these coin mixing schemes on account uh, based blockchain as well. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, so I guess my so like uh, I still have some uh, doubt. Like uh, if if you mix them together, um, but uh, you, you say that in in Ethereum, 
one transaction only take one input and one output, right? So I'm just sort of uh, get confused, like uh, if it's possible, how, how that can be done. So it is possible because you send your coins to a smart contract and then hundred other people also send their coins to your smart contract. And then the owner of the smart contract can take your information offline and di uh, direct your coins from the smart contract to other addresses and then send you the addresses private key offline. There are also decentralized approaches. So coin missing is possible with smart contracts. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so if you don't mind, I have a sort of another question. Um, I see that the, the presentation is very well organized. Like uh, you talk about um, your technical systematically. Um, so basically we have this UTXO based model and also account based model where you can extract the transaction graphs in, in different sort of different format, right? And from there you can and do analysis sort of differently. So I, I'm asking, um, does this difference in graph model um, creates, let's, let's say, um, pros and cons uh, in terms of uh, maybe one type of uh, transaction graph is more suited to do one type of analysis while others. Did you see this? Did you sort of compare and contrast these two different types of transaction graph and uh, in, in terms of their utility? Yes, so uh, we know that, for example, the, the transaction graph is by definition has much fewer nodes than an address graph on UTXO network. So uh, chain analysis companies, when they are looking to identify illicit transactions, they don't try to, they don't use the address graph. They use the transaction graph, which has fewer nodes, and they try to identify if a transaction involves any illicit scheme. Then, once they label that transaction, then they go look at the address. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, if not, I guess we'll thank everybody for attending uh to the tutorial and i guess this is also the last session uh thanks for attending to icd as well uh, dimitris would you like to say a few words as well since you are oh, here uh, as a, as a... thank you thank you everybody for attending this was a great learning experience for all of us and i hope you enjoyed icd as much as we we did i mean it was uh, uh it was great uh uh, so uh, let's not forget but the, tomorrow there is also the um, uh, women in uh, uh, data science the workshop so you can also go there uh, you should actually go uh, and uh, you know till the next time you know Murat yeah thank you thank you for joining so we will follow up with uh, links and other stuff uh, via email so if we're all registered people will email also for all authors as well so you'll get all the links and uh, recordings, etc. Thank you so much for joining and uh, hope to see you face to face in ICD 2021. Hopefully it will be somewhere in Europe, I believe. So hope to see you face to face next time. Thank you all for joining. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.